Um, my definition of horror is anything that makes someone look behind them and really realize what it means to be alive. Whoa, that's a very good answer. <laughs> I think that's, I mean, I that how can we top that? All right. <laughs>There were a lot of touchstones for, for me on this film, you know, um, Rosemary's Baby, Don't Look Now, um, and Nicholas Rogue in general was somebody that I was looking at, and, um, uh, you know, Jack Clayton's The Innocents. Um, there were a lot of old Japanese films that we were talking about, like Ugetsu, Kwaidan, um, Empire of Passion, Kuroniko, um, and, uh, but, but most of the films that I screened for the crew uh, were actually family dramas, um, like films by Mike Lee and In the Bedroom, The Ice Storm. Yeah. We talked a lot about Roman Polanski. Yeah. Talked a lot about Rosemary's Baby. Rosemary's, oh, Roman, but also Chinatown, you and I talked about all the time when we were making it. Yeah, and that's a film I'm always thinking about anyway. Yeah. Macbeth by him. Oh, Ice Storm. Did you say Ice Storm? I did say it. My bad. I wasn't listening. I'm sorry. <laughs> The thing that's cool, so cool about the script is that all the characters are these really nuanced, complex people. So it's hard to just kind of break it down in a little soundbite, but um, I guess Peter is someone who uh, really wants to go along to get along in the beginning of the script, and he's really trying to bury everything. I think he's trying to get on with it and get out of the house and, and, and move on with his life because he has all this trauma with his family, and he kind of just wants, you know, smokes a ton of weed, and, he, and he's trying to escape it, and he has all these little flare-ups with his family, and he tries very hard to just push him down in his stomach, and then something horrible happens, and you watch all this stuff that's inside him start coming to the surface and as much the more he tries to push it down the more it becomes uh, impossible for it not to just explode out of him so to me it's watching someone deteriorate inside and watching um, someone's all their rawest vulnerabilities just uh, explode to the surface and watching that build and, and that's how I describe it I've never seen a teenager go through that in the way that the script I think kind of cleverly navigates um, I would say that Charlie is, um, a person who isn't really like anyone else. She doesn't think the same. Her ideas of everything are different. She's an otherworldly creature that just stepped into this new world and doesn't really understand why things work like they do. And I think that's the best way to describe her. Yeah, I mean it's hard. It's 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 the whole process is sort of unique in its own. I mean it's its own thing. So uh, it's hard to say like what's unique and what's not. I mean I found it to be unique in every way. Like we got to Utah and Millie and I did a lot of different things um, for our characters together. We'd go on these. Um, journeys around Utah in character where, where I'd have to get her to just like order a sandwich or order something and then she would make it impossible and um, she wouldn't say a word and I'd have to buy her a new sweatshirt like Ari gave us these tasks to walk around Utah and do all these things so I mean that is automatically I mean you start to develop these sort of um, these feelings you have these resentments just because, oh my god, she just embarrassed me in front of this person. She just, uh, just hold my hand and cross the goddamn street. Like, there's all these things. And when you have all that, automatically it starts to be like you have a history. And so, I mean, I think that I got really lucky because I've worked with Gabriel before. And he was, you know, part of my family, so I already had a whole history with him. I started to develop a history with Millie, and Tony came a little later. So there was a little bit of distance trying to figure it out. So I, it almost, like, it all formed in a way that was supposed to be what the movie was. So, I mean, I kind of automatically, the, the preparation happened. I was very lucky. It was sort of served on a platter for me already. I didn't, you know, I still had to do a ton of work. I mean, I was like, you know, tortured every day. All, kind of all of us were, but it was a lot. It already helped a lot just kind of creating that environment and stuff.
I want them to be traumatized. I would think that's great, right? I mean, yeah. Ari said that one time, he's like, I just have all this sickness inside me and I want to put it into everybody else. And I was like, that is awesome. <laughs> that's what he said to me day one. Yeah, I just want to yeah, poison people's brains. <laughs> I, I, yeah, make something that, 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 that lingers with people. I have used an Ouija board with friends. Hasn't worked, sadly. <laughs> We've tried, like, multiple times. Like, we'll go in a dark room, midnight, light a few candles, and be like, okay, guys, we'll get ready, we'll get in the mood. <laughs> Nothing happens, though. I'm really disappointed. One day, and then I'll have, like, a great story to tell. But not yet. Not yet. <laughs> no, I'm not going to fool around with that stuff. But I did the seance in the movie, and that was enough. I'm never going to do one again. That was, that was traumatizing enough. I, we had... I never say, um, that's a long story, but I never say the Scottish play, I never say the actual word of the play, because I'm freaked out because a bad experience I had in a play I was doing, everything fell apart, I set it on stage, and all the lights went out, and uh, things, the couch flipped over, and I forgot, like, three monologues, and um, the fan broke, and it was just a disaster, so, but one day, when we were doing that seance scene, Ari said it somehow, and I was like, no, and it's so pretentious to, like, not want to say that word, but then when it happens, you, I was so superstitious, it was dark in the house, I was like, Ari, just go do something, say the midsummer thing, and he was like, oh, it doesn't need to happen, and we were doing the seance, and the glass that's used in it just shattered in my hand without, touching any, I just put it and it shattered in my hand. I was like, you better do those Midsummer Night Streams. He's like, yeah, let me get on that. And uh, he did that. So I'm never gonna do a seance again because that was scary enough. Um, They're all pretty rewarding. It's hard to pick one, just like how picking a favorite's hard because um, you never really got to like see what it was like you saw the film all put together right. and like after seeing all the work that you put in finalized and put together for the final film and how see saw how the story was all set up and how each scene um mattered and each scene was very important if you took one thing out it could change everything just seeing that was really re rewarding at the end mm -hmm. <laughs> Everyone who's watching this is going to be like, that was the weirdest thing. I have to see this movie because I have no yeah. idea what the hell is happening. And then whenever they hear that noise, they'll never be the same again. Yeah. That's true. It's so sad you can never do that again. I know. Or I can just life. see it to freak people out. Yeah, like, or if just someone's not being nice on the street or something, you just, just go, like, and they'll be like, oh my shit. god, demons everywhere.